Hello and welcome to another Royal Society Publishing video podcast. Today I'm here with two guest editors, Petra Kleputz from Cambridge and Jessica Metcalf from Oxford, to talk about their recent Phil Trans B issue on the elimination of infectious diseases. Welcome to you both. Um, first of all, can you explain the term end game to us? When you're controlling an infectious disease, there's going to be a phase where you're sort of plugging along and doing essentially the same thing, you know, deploying more vaccination and nothing really is changing. But at a certain stage, the context is going to change radically. So, for example, the ecological context, the disease is going to change radically because you've reduced levels to such low numbers. The social context is going to change, so who's falling sick is going to be different. The economic context is going to change, the costs involved are going to change. So what we were really interested in getting at in this special issue was trying to gather together results from a range of different diseases about what happens when, during this end game, so when things have become radically different for all these different reasons. And so what's the difference between elimination and eradication of an infectious disease? There is a difference and it's mostly spatial. So elimination would be um, when you interrupted the tr disease transmission in a local area or some regional area, uh, like a continent, uh, whereas uh, eradication uh, is global. So you have eliminated disease worldwide. And so far only two diseases have been eradicated, smallpox for human diseases and rhythm pest for animal diseases. What are some of the major pathogens that we're currently trying to eliminate? So there are two different, uh, I think, um, stages here. Um, there are actually three diseases that um, World Health Organization is trying to eradicate. So they're trying to eliminate globally polio, uh, guinea worm disease and recently uh, yaws, um, which is a bacterial disease. Um, when it comes to elimination, the list is longer and the list includes measles, uh, malaria, lymphatic filariasis. In targeting the different infections that we chose for the special issue, we were really targeting an array of infections which had, had very different issues during the endgame. So they were all ones where once you reduced it to low levels, the problems really changed. And the endgame, that last mile, your strategy that you were going to have to adopt during that last mile was going to change for those reasons. And we wanted to understand all the reasons your strategy might have to change during that last mile. Are some infectious diseases harder to control and eliminate than others? They're definitely different to control. Uh, infectious diseases are different in their mode of transmission. Some are direct from person to person. Some include a vector like mosquito-borne diseases uh, or a guinea worm that uh, has, uh, um, is waterborne, but you get infected by ingesting um, little tiny uh, water fleas that harbor, harbor larvae uh, that then um, uh, reproduce in your body and cause all kinds of different problems. But uh, the strength of transmission is different for different diseases, so measles will be very highly transmittable. Um, so if you're trying to um, interrupt a transmission in a population, you will have to vaccinate a much larger pro proportion of the population for measles than it was the case for smallpox. Other infections, you know, you would use um, vector control or uh, water treatment or behavioral change for humans for diseases that uh, have no uh, known drug or vaccine, such as guinea worm, right? This is a disease that we are very close to uh, eradicating without a use of drug or vaccine, which is really, really a massive success and effort. Within categories, you can probably make comparisons. So Petra mentioned smallpox versus measles. They're transmitted in a very similar way. They're sort of coughing and spitting diseases. So directly transmitted from person to person. And so, and they also have completely immunizing vaccines, but because smallpox one infected person gets much fewer people sick than one infected person with measles. It's actually much easier to slow down smallpox than it is measles. So that, that comparison can be made, but if you're trying to compare measles with guinea worm, where you know, the problem is essentially war in southern Sudan, <laughs> it's very hard to actually say which, which is more difficult, because the problems are so incomparable. So you mentioned earlier that smallpox is one human disease that's been completely eradicated. Why was that so successful? really important thing was I think that they had a um, very good quali uh, quality vaccine and a very stable vaccine so it was um, heat stable so it wasn't one kind of one of those vaccines that you needed to retain a cold supply um, uh, you could transfer it more easily without use of refrigeration which makes it much easier to get to remote cases and remote 
uh, places. We were really lucky in the special issue to uh, be able to interview perhaps the man who was most important to the success of this campaign, uh, D.A. Henderson. And he makes the point that it's the only disease for which we have had, which human populations have developed gods. And that's because it was so devastating. It's scarring and it killed people. It was so recognisable. So it was quite easy to get the international community to get behind an effort to eliminate smallpox. You know, they might be things which had a really easy biology, but nobody cares about. Can you explain some of the challenges typical of endgame elimination? I think by the very nature of the problem, the last people that you have to vaccinate or find and treat are always going to be the hardest, just because they're the ones you haven't found till then. <laughs> so that's going to be a common problem. It can manifest in very different ways. So for some of our neglected tropical diseases, the problem is that they're in very remote parts of Latin America. For others, they'll be like you know somewhere in the middle of Lagos, so it's very hard to get to people in these really, really dense human populations. For immunising infections like measles and smallpox and rubella, what happens is that if you, once you've started vaccinating, you can get to the point where you interrupt transmission of the disease. So the disease is not getting around, but you're also not vaccinating everybody. So you can think of it as, um, and then the, once you've had this disease, you never have it again, right? So if you've had the disease and you're sort of removed from the potential population that can get sick, but if you haven't, you're sort of building up, and that population, if the disease isn't occurring, keeps growing and growing and growing. And then an immigrant arrives and you might have a huge outbreak. And that's a really common problem during the end game for all the immunizing infections, because you always have this issue that you're almost always not getting everybody. So people will be coming, new individuals are born into the population, and that, that potential outbreak size keeps growing. What about the differences between humans and animals when it comes to eliminating infectious disease? Well, the, uh, the most striking difference that immediately springs to mind is that animals don't really refuse vaccination <laughs> or drugs. <laughs> so in one sense, it can be quite a lot easier. They're the most exciting uh, recent story for, from this point of view for animals is the recent elimination of rinderpest in cattle populations. So, so not just elimination, but eradication. So it's the only other disease that's ever been eradicated. One that I didn't know much about before we did the special issue is the, the question of foot and mouth disease. So we had a really interesting article about um, foot and mouth disease elimination in the Americas. And it's an incredibly economic issue because the, the, the countries involved are heavily invested in meat production and meat production for exportation to the global market. And you can't, you're not allowed to export meat unless you have certified that you don't have foot and mouth disease. And I think that, in a way, you know, I don't know of many innovations that are going to make things spectacularly easier. I can think of lots of things that's going to make it harder and harder. So evolution is the one we've been talking about. Human mobility just grows and grows. If you're trying to eliminate a disease and people are just moving it around at high speeds, it becomes much, much more difficult. So people have become more mobile, but has technology allowed us to track disease outbreaks uh, more quickly? It definitely is getting easier. Uh, I think one Part of the problem here is motivating people to share data in real time um, and also make it available for research communities so that they, they can analyze that data. And that may be lagging a little bit. Uh, countries are not always incentivized to report cases. Um, like we've seen with the example of SARS, that China at first tried to mask the outbreak um, before it became uh, public that there is a new coronavirus that is uh, very deadly. Um, so while at the same time we do have definitely new technological methods, I think social media are sometimes wonderful for spreading data quickly, um, also spreading rumors very quickly. So sometimes it's harder to disentangle which of these sources are really corroborated new infections and which are just like maybe not. <laughs> The issue we're sort of circulating around tends to be asymptomatics moving around. So people who are not showing signs of disease moving around, spreading it to a new place, and that would make control really difficult. Presumably, uh, diagnostic techniques are getting better and better. So for example, for polio, we can now detect polio in sewage, which is a game changer, right? Because now we can say, instead of worrying about the fact that this polio is moving invisibly around the landscape, we can go and check the sewage systems. Thank you very much, and thank you for watching.